Hi, thank you to Stephen and the organizers for having me here. I was just at uh, ASSC 16 in Brighton, so it's a pretty consciousness intense uh, couple of weeks for me. Um, I would like to begin with the, um, this uh, thermostat, which was described by, by David Chalmers many, many years ago as having some limited form of conscious awareness uh, because it can find itself in different states. And um, I disagree with this intuition. Um, I think it's appropriate to say that the thermostat is sensitive to temperature, but not that it is conscious of temperature. So why not? Well, because the thermostat does not know that it's sensitive to temperature. It's just sensitive to temperature. But conscious knowledge, it seems, is always knowledge that you know that you possess. So you may say, well, it would be easy to make it so that the thermostat is able to report on its internal states. You, can, you could rig it up to a speech synthesizer and have a simple computer program, for instance, uh, that translates its internal states into verbal reports, so to speak. But I think that everybody would agree that this would be faking it. Why is that? Well, because we know that, in fact, the thermostat does not care about temperature. It doesn't even care about its own existence. It doesn't have experiences, in other words, because nothing ever means anything to it. So what would it take, then, for the thermostat to care about its own internal states? Well, it would take a whole bunch of different things, but in particular, it would take the ability for the thermostat to be sensitive to its environment and to its own states in a way that matters to it. Thus, it would take the ability to have goals, to pursue them, to avoid danger, to fall in love, to worry about its own existence, and so on. And that is all the machinery of agenthood. Then you can ask, well, what does it take uh, for something to turn into an agent? Well, again, it takes a lot of different things, but I think that all of these things require the ability to learn. And so why is that? Well, because learning is necessary to grow itself, to know what one wants, to develop preferences, to seek rewarding states, to learn about good and bad things, and so on and so forth. And so by this reasoning, awareness requires agenthood. And this is something that Frege pointed out uh, many, many years ago by saying that it seems absurd to us that a pain, a mood, a wish should rub about the world without a bearer independently. An experience, says Frege, is impossible without an experience. The inner world uh, presupposes the person whose inner world it is. And uh, I cannot help but be struck by contemporary discussions about the differences between conscious and unconscious states. For instance, and in, um, as you can see many uh, in ASSC and other meetings, um, we always talk about these states as though they were precisely, as Frege points out, independence of their existence and their being embedded uh, in a subject. Um, you can make the very same points that I made about this thermostat, about carnivorous uh, plants, for instance. Uh, they give the impression of having intentional behavior, in a sense, uh, intentional in the sense of having intentions. Um, and you can see it here, crushing this insect. Uh, but of course, um, very few would grant any uh, modicum of consciousness to uh, the plant, and so likewise, I think that this speaks of an important distinction, which is a distinction between sensitivity on the one hand and uh, awareness. I'm very much interested in the uh, talk that will be delivered tomorrow about plant intelligence. I think this is a truly fascinating debate. Um, so all this points to discussions of, uh, about what is experience, and uh, I'm not going to try to solve the hard problem here, but. Uh, of course, one uh, needs to mention the, the work of Thomas Nagel here, who, point, uh, who pointed out that um, no matter how much we know about the brain of a bat, we'll never know what it feels like to chase insects at dusk. Uh, in other words, there seems to be a, a very tall or very deep gap between our understanding of the biology uh, that substance the differences between conscious and unconscious states on one hand and uh, the uh, subjective char character of such states uh, on the other hand. Now, this is really a vexing problem, and um, I've been thinking about this for many, many years now. And when I think about experience, conscious experience, say the experience of seeing a patch of red, uh, it's easy enough to take it to, to be what it feels like. That was Nagel's uh, original take on it. It's what it feels like, and we all have an intuition about uh, what that is. 
and also of the distinction between that and cases where no such experience is present. But when you try to further define that, all I can come up with is um, the rich network of associations, be they cognitive or affective, uh, that characterize your particular experience of the color red. So for you, red may evoke uh, the color of the dress that uh, your date wore when you first uh, met her. Uh, for somebody else, it may be the color of a fire truck that he played with uh, as a child, the color of tomatoes, the color of blood, and vampires, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that what it means to see red is entirely subsumed by the network of such associations that have a, has accrued, this network has accrued, as a result of your personal trajectory through existence, that is, as a result of your learning about um, what characterizes red things. So, what it feels like can only mean the emotional value associated with the state of affairs and the vast, complex, richly structured, experience-dependent network of associations that the system has learned to associate with that state of affairs. Further, having experiences presupposes an experiencer that cares about its experiences. That was uh, in part Frege's point. So there's nothing it is like to be a thermostat or a camera or a carnivorous plant because such devices or organisms do not even know they have internal states, and so they cannot care about which states they find themselves in. And so from that point of view, consciousness always involves some form of metacognition. If I'm sensitive to some state of affairs, one will say that I'm conscious of this state of affairs if and only if I can report awareness of my sensitivity and so have some form of uh, access to my own internal states. Both sensitivity and metacognition, and this is uh, what I will argue over the course of uh, the talk, are the result of adaptation mechanisms. Importantly, at different time scales, that is, over the course of evolution, development, learning, or even over the, the time that's available to process a stimulus um, in a single trial. Now, uh, where do feelings come from? Uh, that is, you know, that's, that, that I think is, that is a really hard question. I've been interested recently in uh, what uh, Nicholas Humphrey has to say about it, and so here's his reasoning. He says that sensation began as overt bodily behaviors. So first, there's action. For a primitive organism, he says, the activity of sensing red, for instance, may have involved responding to red light on one part of its surface with a particular behavior. The subjective proto-experience, as he says, corresponded to the form of response. To sense red was to issue the commands for the response. And this is completely congruent with another bunch of ideas that I like, that is uh, the uh, sensory motor theory as developed by Kevin O'Regan and uh, also uh, Alva Noe. The sensory activities, continues Humphreys, occurred in the public domain and were shaped by natural selection. For each stimuli, a stimulus, a behavior got selected as the biologically adaptive response. Then later, some responses became, became less important. To identify the stimuli, however, the organism required the resulting sensory representations. For that, it had to monitor its own response by issuing the customary commands. So this is a, I mean, there's traces of that idea in the work uh, of Daniel Wolpert, for instance, on forward inverse modeling uh, and uh, the notion of efference copy. Such commands related to now irrelevant behaviors that have been made irrelevant by evolution got short-circuited, resulting in no behavior. And sensory activity became an internal loop within the brain. This is the basis for O'Regan and the other sensory motor theorists to claim that perception is a form of action. Vision is not something that goes from the world to your brain. It is something, uh, it is a form of action. This had, and that concludes uh, Humphrey's reasoning, the dramatic consequence of becoming self-sustaining and partly self-creating sensory experience moved into the subjective presence. And so here is this idea, and so my talk is also structured in loops where I explore these ideas at deeper and deeper levels, so if I completely run out of time, at least you have the uh, core idea right now. Um, and the set of ideas from what I've called the radical plasticity thesis. And so we begin with this uh, suggestion by Nicholas Humphrey, in the beginning is action. Then we continue with the idea that the brain continuously and unconsciously, this is critical, learns to redescribe its own activity to itself, by assessing the consequences of action in the brain itself. 
which is what I call the inner loop, on behavior, the action loop, and on the behavior of other people, uh, which you can think of as the mind loop. And those three loops depend on each other, forming a tangled hierarchy. That is, the inner loop, for instance, is informed by what happens uh, uh, in the uh, outer loop. This process of redescribing your own activity to yourself is uh, something that was described by Andy Clark and Annette Carmen of Smith in the context of cognitive development, and we'll get over that uh, in more detail later. So to put this claim even more provocatively then, consciousness is the brain's non-conceptual, this is crucial too, non-conceptual theory about itself gained through experience interacting with itself, with the world, and with other people. And in that sense, consciousness depends on the operation of unconscious prediction-driven learning mechanisms, which is related to Friston's predictive coding ideas. Um, and uh, it is thus a form of inactive, non-conceptual, higher-order thought theory. Ala Rosenthal, which, uh, whom you heard uh, earlier, to the extent that it involves meta-representations, that is, representations that target other representations uh, in your brain. There's lots of evidence of these loops uh, just for conceptual relief. Here are two uh, good examples. This is uh, Fritz uh, Strack's demonstration of um, the influence that bodily states play on uh, your um, experiences. Uh, he asked participants to hold a pen in their mouth using a sophisticated cover story. This is a social psychology. Uh, to hold uh, a pen uh, in the manner depicted on the left or in the manner depicted in the right. And then he asked participants to judge how funny cartoons were and showed that the manner in which the pen was held influenced people's judgments of those cartoons so that people holding the pen in the manner depicted in the left judged the cartoons to be funnier than people holding uh, the pen uh, in the manner depicted in the right. Now, why is this? Well, because, of course, when you hold the pen this way, your muscles are in the configuration that they have when you smile, whereas when you hold the pen this way, they are in the configuration that they have when you express disgust. And so uh, this is the facial feedback hypothesis, and it indicates that there is a loop that goes from behavior to your uh, subjective states. Here is another illustration of such loops in action, this time involving a completely different factor, which is social presence. This is one of Chris Friss's favorite experiments, and I'm going to try to replicate it, too, because I only half believe these experiments, and I've been recently involved in lots of uh, failed and published and difficult, controversial uh, replications of social psychology experiments. But anyway, it's a beautiful st uh, study if it works out. This was carried out in the lab of a social psychology, in the kitchen, sorry, of a social psychology lab. And so uh, what was manipulated was the picture, the poster, uh, taped on the uh, fridge in that lab, and this could either be flowers uh, during one week or a face, or eyes like this, uh, uh, on the other week. And the beautiful dependent measure was the amount of money that people left in the basket next to the coffee machine when they took some, uh, when they took some coffee. Yeah, so you volunteer some, you know, some, some some coins in that basket so that the staff can buy further coffee for the week after. And as you can see, here is the amount of money. All the black dots correspond to uh, eye weeks, and all the uh, clear dots correspond to flower weeks. Amazingly enough, there's more money left in the basket when, uh, when eyes are on the fridge. Now, why is that? Well, of course, it is so because, people, because the eyes remind people that their behavior may be observed by other people, even though they were alone in the kitchen when uh, taking the coffee. Uh, and so the eyes act as a reminder of social presence, and of course we adapt our behavior to be more morally acceptable and socially acceptable um, when we know that we are observed by others, and there's, there's no such thing uh, in the case of uh, flowers. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole story. Now let me develop uh, this in different directions, and for this I need to uh, take a very brief look at uh, contemporary theories of consciousness. Here is Dan Dennett, whom you heard the other day, and I wish I could have been there. Uh, but his, one of his big ideas, he's got many big ideas, one of, one of his big ideas is that consciousness is akin to fame in the brain. So we have competing mental representations, and what the representations or the story that we end up being conscious of is the one that has won the competition. So competing representations are instantiating fame in the brain. 
Here is David Rosenthal, and uh, as you know, his perspective on the differences, say, between conscious and unconscious uh, cognition is completely different because it involves the idea that representations become conscious in virtue of the existence of higher order thoughts, which I call meta-representations, that indicate that the agent, uh, that unconsciously indicate that the agent possesses the uh, corresponding first order representation. Many theories uh, today uh, converge towards some version of fame in the brain uh, idea, and the best example of that is uh, the Hans uh, and Bernie Barr's uh, neural workspace idea, according to which the brain is constituted by many modules that can carry out their work semi-automatically, but there is a crucial network of high-level modules that are interconnected by means of long-distance cortical-cortical connections in cortex, uh, and um, a representation becomes a conscious representation when it enters into contact of that workspace, which functionally plays the role of making then that representation available for global consumption by any other module in the brain. And so it achieves fame in the brain in virtue of finding itself in the neural workspace. Rosenthal's idea is uh, more difficult to convey graphically, but here it is. Uh, a mental, the brain is looking at itself in a sense. And so he says a mental state is conscious if we are conscious of being in that mental state. And we are conscious of being in a mental state when we have a thought that we are in that mental state. And so in some sense, Rosenthal, a mental state is a conscious mental state in virtue of having a higher order thought that you yourself are in that mental state. And crucially, that higher order thought doesn't need itself to be conscious. And so we avoid the, uh, uh, one of the uh, difficulties that many people have with this theory, which is the in an, a sort of infinite uh, process of uh, redescription. Now, I would like to suggest I find things to like in both ideas, um, and this is a domain where everybody has his own version of uh, you know, his, uh, uh, his uh, theory. But one of the questions that I've always asked myself coming from having looked at uh, learning for many, many years, how do we get there? Uh, are we born with the neural workspace? Does it develop, or, and, and if so, how? Um, and uh, insofar as high order thoughts are concerned, well, again, same question, how do we get there? And what I would like to suggest is that we get there by learning mechanisms. Unconscious learning mechanisms, unconscious prediction driven learning mechanisms uh, a la, uh, la Friston. So, what can we say about plasticity in the brain? Well, lots of different things, and I will go very quickly here. You, everybody knows this uh, study that compared taxi drivers and bus drivers and a large hippocampi in London. There's also very interesting uh, studies of sensory substitution. Fascinating work by Mihang Gashou on rewiring uh, ferrets in the fetus. Uh, prism adaptation, of course, the continuous adaptation of sensory systems to changing hardware as we develop. Uh, as an infant develops, his body is completely changing, and so that requires continuous learning of uh, how to control these from day to day different uh, limbs and uh, so on. Uh, there's also individual differences in cortical representation. Uh, for me, the best talk at ASSC 16 was Geraint Reese's presentation, in which he showed that the Ebbinghaus illusion, which involves circles surrounded by other circles, and so if a circle is surrounded by a large circle, you perceive it to be smaller than if the same circle is surrounded by small circles. Yeah? So this generates a size illusion. So you can quantify this by asking people to indicate when the two circles appear of identical size to them. And then you have a number that represents how strong this illusion is for a particular individual. And as it turns out, there are individual differences in how much of the illusion uh, occurs for you. And strikingly, he was able to relate this to the size of V1 as uh, assessed by means of red Tonop, uh, topic uh, mapping, mapping, yeah? So very intricate experiments. But so the larger your V1, the smaller the illusion. And the reason is that, well, if uh, V1 is larger, there's maybe less competition between the context, the inducers, basically, and the central circle, yeah? But I find it fascinating that this translates, uh, translates into physical distance between neurons, basically, yeah? Uh, or, 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 or just there being more neurons available uh, to represent the same information. Here is the best example of radical plasticity. This is a case uh, which was reported a couple of years ago in France. It's a 44-year-old man 
uh, everything goes fine, but he comes to his neurologist because he experiences a weakness in the left leg. And so history reveals that this person had suffered from hydrocephalus as an infant. It was implanted with a drain that controlled this hydrocephalus for 14 years, after which the drain failed. He had to be operated on again. He received a new drain. Uh, and then 30 years go by, and this person has a social life. He's got a family and so on and so forth. Uh, he's tested for IQ on this occasion. His IQ is uh, just below the normal range at 75, but his verbal IQ is normal, 84, you know. So uh, by all means, this person is uh, uh, relatively normal. And then for the first time, they carry out a CT scan on this person's brain. And this is what the CT scan reveals. There's no brain left. Uh, all that there's left is a thin layer of cortex and some subcortical structure. Over 80% of this person's brain has vanished uh, as a result of this very, very progressive insult that extended over 30 years. I find it completely remarkable that this person uh, can walk around the world and be uh, as conscious as you and I, and I find it particularly challenging uh, for uh, any sort of neuroanatomically based theory of consciousness to account for this. When I talk to my neurologist friends, they all say, well, Everything is there, you know, the hippocampus, V1, and parietal cortex, but it's, it's been completely reshuffled and reorganized. I find it remarkable that the brain can even do that, and it's, it is suggestive of, well, there's no other word, radical plasticity. So, in the rest of the talk, I'd like to go, if there's time, over four points. One is this notion of quality of representation, which uh, I think is important to understand um, um, how representations can achieve fame in the brain. The second point is meta-representation, uh, that is this other word for uh, Rosenthal's high order thoughts. Then I would like to say a few words about theory of mind and, uh, well, radical plasticity is going to be uh, all over. So let's talk about this notion of uh, quality of representation and the motivation for that was uh, four misconceptions about consciousness. I'll just go over these very quickly. The first misconception, I think, is that consciousness is a single thing. It's, it's neither a single anything, and it's certainly not a thing. Uh, the second is that consciousness is static. I think it's uh, best described as a process. The third misconception is that consciousness is all or none. Uh, I think there's lots of reasons to think that it's graded. Uh, and the uh, fourth is that consciousness sits between perception and action. There is just states in your mind uh, between perception and action, whereas there's lots of evidence as I've shown you already for the existence of um, loops. So that provided uh, the motivation to develop or to attempt to develop a graded adaptive account of consciousness uh, in which we begin by assuming that that new information processing is inherently unconscious, that plasticity is mandatory, that is we learn all the time whether we intend to or not and including in the absence of awareness, the brain is fundamentally plastic that conscious and unconscious processing are rooted in the same interacting learning mechanisms and representational systems, and that consciousness involves graded, continuous, and dynamic processes that depend on this construct, which I call quality of representation, and which involves three dimensions by which you can characterize a neural or a mental representation. The strength of that representation, of which you can think of, for instance, as the number of units or neurons firing, or contributing to a particular representation. The second dimension is stability in time, how, st how stable in time is this uh, representation, how long uh, it is allowed to exist. And the third dimension is distinctiveness. This goes back to my uh, Geraint Reese V1 argument, uh, that is how distinct one particular representation is from competing representations. And so if you put all that together, you end up with this construct of quality of representation, which I've represented here on the x-axis, and on the y-axis here on these uh, graphs, I represent the extent to which a representation of a particular quality is then available to form uh, different aspects of uh, processing or uh, awareness. And so this first relationship here, which is roughly nonlinear, simply depicts how strong uh, uh, a... Um, how strongly a representation of a certain quality can influence behavior. Yeah? And so, not surprisingly, weak representations, for instance, uh, perhaps characteristic of subliminal perception, can only exert a weak influence on behavior. 
very strong representations, characteristics of automaticity, for instance, uh, such as when you're driving or just standing up and so on and so forth, exert very strong effects uh, on behavior. And you can think of this x-axis uh, here as representing quality of representation, but also the processes that make representations get to be stronger. Yeah? So this can depict uh, changes in a particular representation's quality over time and over, at different time scales, that is over evolution, development, learning, or over the course of a single trial, so that, for instance, um, it can refer also to stimulus duration in, in the context of a uh, psychophysical uh, experiment. One side consequence of this is that uh, consciousness takes time. If you want to have a strong representation, well, it needs uh, some time at these different uh, time scales. This uh, second curve here in red is meant to uh, correspond to cognitive control, and it, it's, mean, it, it's meant to capture the intuition that uh, you don't need to exert control over weak representations, because these representations being weak, they only exert very weak effects on behavior, and so you, you can sort of ignore these. Yeah? Uh, if, if you have a priming effect of uh, 10 milliseconds, it's not gonna do much in terms of the adaptive value of your actions. Yeah? Likewise, if you assume that the way representations get to be of high quality is by means of me learning mechanisms whose goal it is to increase uh, the adaptiveness of behavior, if you assume that, then those representations that have become of high quality are representations that are adapted. Yeah? And so you don't need to exert control over those representations because being adapted, you can sort of leave, leave these representations to do the work that they do without conscious monitoring uh, being necessary to exert, uh, to, uh, to control what, what it is that they do. And so that I take to be correct, that I take to be the reason why automatic behavior has this ballistic character. You know, you can it's, you leave it to your own devices. So that leaves this middle region, dubbed here explicit cognition, as the region uh, where the agent needs to exert conscious monitoring over the influence of representations, precisely because those are representations that are sort of strong enough to begin exerting strong effects on behavior, yet not so strong that they can be trusted uh, to be fully adapted. Yeah? Sometimes the adaptation fails as well. Uh, I was in London just uh, yesterday, and uh, in central London, my life is always in danger because despite all the reminders printed uh, on the sidewalks, I cannot prevent myself from looking the wrong side of the road. I, I just, it, it's just impossible, um, no, no matter how much I, and I've got other things to do than to think about where to look in the street, but still, you know, even when I'm sort of acutely aware of this, I always systematically look the wrong, uh, maybe I'm a bit frontal, but I think this is an experience that many people share. So that's a good example of a completely cultural adaptation. It's a learned behavior, which was completely appropriate in Belgium and on the continent, but completely maladapted in uh, cultures where one drives on the other side of the road. And because it is so strong, it has gotten so automatic that I cannot exert control over it anymore, which is what one finds uh, in the Stroop situation and so on and so forth. Now, if you just add these two curves together, and I don't mean to be mathematically accurate here, just to convey intuitions, you get this yellow curve, which I take to correspond to the extent to which a representation is available to form the contents of conscious awareness. And this predicts a peak here, just in the region where you would expect it. It also says that weak representations are not available to form the contents of conscious experience, but that these very strong representations characteristic of automatic behavior are to a lesser degree, available to form the contents of experience. And I think this is correct. Uh, Zelgoff is say, saying that automatic behavior is mostly characterized not by the fact that it's unconscious, which many people think, uh, but by the fact that it's ballistic. But in fact, when you drive, for instance, you can completely focus your attention on the movements that you perform, and whatever you do can fill your consciousness in a manner that it's simply impossible to achieve with subliminal stimuli. Subliminal stimuli, you look as hard as you can, it doesn't change anything. With automatic behavior, consciousness has become optional in a sense. It isn't necessary anymore, but if you want uh, it to be there, well, you can. So, as you can see, all these relationships are graded and they're meant to capture the idea that the transition between unconscious processing and conscious processing is something that is graded and dynamic and dependent on learning mechanisms. These are 
ideas that are difficult to explore empirically. What we've done is look at, um, uh, because learning experiments take a long, a long time, there's some interesting stuff being done on subliminal perception experiments. I'm always, we're struck by the fact, for instance, that people who carry out experiments with subliminal uh, perception are often aware they, uh, as experimenters, of the, uh, of the primes. Yeah? Why? Well, because they've sat programming these things for many, many hours, so they have lots of expertise. Uh, with that. So we're doing these sorts of experiments, but we've mostly looked at uh, this notion of gradedness uh, in collaboration with Morton Overgaard, who developed this uh, perceptual awareness scale, which is a scale that you can collect to um, obtain structured reports about what it is that people saw in the context of a visual perception experiment. And that scale, which initially had seven levels set up by participants themselves, now has four, no experience, a brief glimpse, an almost clear experience and a completely clear experience. Overgaard showed that these intermediate uh, stages had their own neural correlates. I won't get into that. One of the things we did with that was to um, uh, look at what happens when we ask people to make a simple discrimination between these four shapes here uh, in a psychophysical design. So each shape appears for a duration and then it's, it's masked. Um, and this duration can vary between very short durations, uh, 17 milliseconds, all the way to uh, durations where the stimulus is visible. And so on each trial, they have to indicate which um, shape was presented. Is it a circle, a square, a diamond, and so on and so forth. And then they also have to use this pass scale, or one of three different scales, basically, to indicate what the experience of the stimulus was. Yeah? So did you see the stimulus? One, two, three, four. Uh, in one case, the scale we used was confidence ratings. Are you certain that you made the right decision? Uh, one, two, three, four. In another scale, this was the perceptual awareness scale that I just described. What was your experience of the stimulus? No experience, a brief glimpse, and so on and so forth. And the, th uh, the, the third scale was post-decision wagering, in which case we asked people to bet on their own performance. Yeah? And they can bet a small amount of money or a large amount of money. We compared what happens with each of these uh, three scales. Here are the points of each uh, of the uh, three scales. And here is stimulus duration. And the only point I want to make here is if you look at post-decision wagering, for instance, you see that the transition between uh, the durations where people use bet very low amounts of money and the durations where people begin betting high, lots of uh, uh, solid amounts of money, is rather abrupt. Yeah? And it's completely different from what you get with this perceptual awareness scale. So the point is that there is gradedness in people's experience of these uh, brief stimuli, but you have to use the right measure in order to find it out. And so uh, you get it with uh, this perceptual awareness scale. You don't get it with post-decision wagering. In a more recent experiment, what we did was to compare, to directly ask uh, the question, is consciousness graded or dichotomous? The hand would say it's dichotomous. Victor Lammer would say it's graded. Uh, and so what we did was to try to design one experiment where we can contrast uh, both cases. And this experiment involved colored numbers presented uh, with pre and post masks at different durations. At some durations, they're impossible to see. At other durations, uh, they can be seen. People have to perform one of two tasks on these digits. Either they have to indicate whether the number is smaller or larger than five, that's the high-level task. In the other task, they have to indicate whether the number is uh, red or blue, basically. Yeah? That's the other task, and it's a low-level task because it's about color. Uh, and then they have to indicate on each trial what their experience of the stimulus was using this perceptual or perception scale. What do we find? Well, to cut a long story short, we find a more or less linear relationship in terms of their accuracy in doing this task and in terms of subjective visibility as reported by the perceptual uh, awareness scale, and a much uh, more nonlinear relationship when the task is the high-level task. So when they have to indicate whether the number is smaller or larger than five, we find a relationship that is a psychophysical function that is nonlinear and makes you think that uh, awareness is dichotomous in a sense, both here and there. When the task is a low-level task, we get this more graded relationship. So again, whether consciousness is all or none or graded may depend on the task and the stability that people uh, perform. 
Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to need at least 40 more minutes, but uh, I will cut it short. <laughs> so the second thing is meta representation. So this was quality of representation. The second thing is meta representation. Quality is not enough um, because you can have very strong, high quality representations that fail to be represented in conscious experience. Now, here is an example of such a stimulus. This is not a photograph, it's a movie, and it's changing right now. Uh, and it's been changing, it's a loop, it lasts uh, 12 seconds, and so something is changing in that picture at this point, and I don't know if you see what it is. Um, and I'm not gonna wait my, waste my five minutes waiting for you to find out. So I'll just tell you, what changes is the entire facial expression of the central actor, which goes from an expression where he is emotionally neutral to an expression where he frankly smiles. You can see it if you focus on his mouth, basically. Now he's in the neutral expression, and you can see gradually move, you know, he's gradually moving towards an expression where he smiles. <laughs> you can show this for 30 or 40 times to participants, they fail to notice the change. But the change is presented centrally. It concerns a substantial portion of the display. So, it, you know, at some level, it's a high quality representation, but you simply fail to notice it. Another such example, of course, is blind sight. Uh, in blind sight, uh, people claim not to see anything. Yet, uh, in this particular patient, for instance, who was tested by Bea de Gelder, um, there are visual representations, or at least representations, that make it possible for this patient to navigate this obstacle course improvised in the, cur in the hallway of the, uh, of the lab exactly as though the person was sighted. But he says, I'm blind, you know? This is 10 years, I think, post-accident, uh, post, uh, yeah? So over the course of these 10 years, this person has learned unconsciously to navigate his visual environment while still claiming that he doesn't see anything and that he has no visual experiences anymore. So two examples of, uh, uh, of uh, high quality representations that uh, fail to be conscious and so the missing ingredient, I think, is Rosenthal's higher order thoughts. So this is what I prefer to call meta representations. And it's the idea that some representations are the target of other representations. This connects very well with the ideas put forward by Hakon Lo earlier uh, uh, this morning. He says, here is a signal detection situation. D prime characterizes the difference between the two distribution, the distribution for noise and the distribution for signal. Uh, Lowe says D prime has nothing to do with awareness. What has to do with awareness is where you set your threshold. If you set the threshold too high, then you get blindsight, apparent blindness, because everything, including um, the noise, uh, including the signal, is taken to be noise. You get the reverse situation if you put your threshold too low. Then you get uh, hallucinations because even the noise is taken to be signal. We looked at this in uh, blindside as well, but I will skip that. That's more to an overgard to get to the idea in the two minutes I have left. Um, we looked at this from a computational point of view. Take a simple connectionist network, for instance. This can do an any number of highly sophisticated tasks using backpropagation, for instance. This can learn the structure of complex uh, stimuli. You can analyze uh, using pre-imaging sort of imaging methods uh, what uh, the structure of the internal representations are. Um, but the point is that whatever knowledge this network learns, however sophisticated that knowledge may be, is always knowledge that is in the system, as Clark and Kelmer of Smith put it, as opposed to being knowledge for the system. Yeah? In the very sense that I hinted at with my thermistor example, this is not knowledge that the network can manipulate or access in any way. It's only knowledge that can be deployed in action. Yeah? The network can express this knowledge, but it doesn't even know that it possesses this knowledge. So how do we, do, how do we build a system that has access to its own internal representations? Well, one can have an observing system that looks at these internal states and tries to do something with it, and this can be another network. And so that's what we try to do, basically. I'm going quickly, huh? sorry, we can return to that uh, in the discussion. So this is the idea that was put forward by Clark and Carmel Smith. I won't read everything, but they say, the C-slug and the VAX mainframe are both effective processors of information, yet it is only human beings and perhaps some higher animals who are credited with genuine thoughts. 
Is this mere prejudice, or have we somehow latched onto a genuine joint in the natural order? The hypothesis to be considered is that there is indeed a joint in the natural order. The joint, we argue, marks a pivotal difference in internal organization. The representational redescription model embodies specific hypotheses about the nature of this joint. So what would be the functions of such meta-representations? Well, it would be to indicate mental attitude, that is, the manner in which the first order representations are known. Is it something that I know to be true? Is it something I believe? And so on and so forth. So meta-representations make it possible for an agent to know the geography of its own representations and to share their mental states with other agents. It is, in a way, signal detection on your own internal representations rather than on the external world. And there is type 2D prime, for instance, which uh, is meant to capture precisely that and which has been looked at, uh, interestingly, by uh, Fleming. My claim is that this is something that the brain learns uh, unconsciously. Meta representations also make it possible for an agent to predict the consequences of his own uh, actions. So what we did, and I'll, I'll, I'll be finishing in two or three minutes, really, <laughs> very quickly. Huh? We take this network, we turn it on its side, and it becomes input to another second-order network, the task of which is to look at the internal representations of the first order network. And so this is the brain learning about the world. This is the brain learning about itself. And I'll skip all the data that I wanted to show you, uh, just to tell you that we applied this sort of architecture to a variety of problems that uh, look at the relationships between first order performance in any number of different tasks and second-order performance, that is, confidence judgments, for instance. And this works extremely well. That is, we have these networks that can learn to perform in these tasks, say the Iowa gambling task, blind sight, artificial grammar learning tasks. In all of these cases, we were able to develop networks of the kinds I've described that were able to capture uh, the relationships between first-order performance on the one hand and confidence judgments uh, on the other hand. Is it conscious? Well, no, but I think that this representational redescription idea is a very important uh, uh, mechanism. I will close with this. Um, here's the uh, global workspace, and I, I told you, well, how do we get there? Well, here's one way that we could get there, I think. Um, you take uh, a module with a first-order chain of processing, the brain learning about the world, and a second-order uh, chain of processing, subsumed here by this simple circle, that looks at the activity in each of the layers of this first-order chain. Yeah? So that, let's call that a module. Now you add many such modules, and that's what the brain is made up of. And then you connect the central bits, which are higher-level nodes, so to speak. And then you get the global workspace. But now you get it in a way that involves learning mechanisms and uh, in a way that involves the, the sorts of representational redescriptions uh, mechanisms that uh, I've described. Now, I've got a beautiful story about theory of mind, but since I should conclude, I will conclude. Um, so this radical plasticity idea is the idea that the brain continuously and unconsciously learns about the world by anticipating the consequences of action itself by learning about the consequences of activity in one brain region on activity in other brain regions. I think this is also something that the brain has to learn, how SMA activity, for instance, is connected with M1 activity. And uh, it also learns unconsciously and continuously about other people by building models of their mental states based on assessing the consequences of action on their behavior. Others thus act as external selves during development, providing matter representations where they lack. And so you can think of this as the inactive view, but turn both further inwards and further outwards. And in that sense, consciousness is the brain's unconscious theory about itself, unconscious, embodied, enacted, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, je est un autre, uh, as, um, as the poet said. Um, we are, in that sense, virtual of a others because we become selves by learning how to use, well, learning to infer mental representations and using those other people's mental representations to construct our own identity. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. I'll have our questions, please. Yes. Um, hi, Andreas Kaga from Sweden. Uh, I have a question regarding your uh, the three loops you were mentioning. You have like an inner loop, action loop, and the mind loop. Uh, regarding the inner loop, so what does what